Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And I want to say to the worship team, thank you so much, and Emily, for those selection of songs. It just, it's just, thank you. I want to start out this morning by asking, have you ever found yourself asking the question, why did this happen? Why do I have to deal with this? Anyone? Anybody have any great opportunities just this past week to get to say some words like that? Any problems this week? Well, I remember a day in my own life where I had had a whole lot of these great, awesome opportunities to get to say, why? And I felt the tension building up inside, and I felt like I needed to take a break. So after making a few arrangements, I hopped in my car, drove up here to the church. I didn't come in the building, but I sat over in the parking lot over here on the side, and I stared up at the trees in the sky, and I just started pouring it out to God. I mean, pouring. And I'm not sure, I may have asked God to give me his perspective on all the things I was dealing with that week. And I felt him break into my prayers and heard very clearly these words. Janelle, your life is going to be one problem after another until the day you die. That's what I heard. But that wasn't all that I heard. I also heard... I'm going to be faithful, and I'm going to help you and carry you through every single one of them if you just put them in my hands. And strangely enough, this warm, calming peace settled over me, something I wasn't expecting after just being told. Problems aren't going away. It's not going to get any better. But there was this fight and resistance in my spirit that died in those moments. As I continued praying, I thought about the reality that this isn't heaven yet here on earth. So the bigger answer to why anything bad or irritating or frustrating or sad happens is always the fact that I live in a fallen, broken world. I am broken, and I live amongst broken people. And so, of course, things go wrong. Of course, things don't go the way we always want. And then it started hitting me that I had been wasting years of precious time and energy, that I could have been learning to deal with problems in healthy and productive ways, or God's ways, on being angry and frustrated, that I even had to deal with problems. And I was also wasting time and energy denying problems, trying to hide from the pain and hide from others in my pain. That's a lot of work, too. And this prayer time in my car became a game changer in my life. You see, somewhere I think deep down inside, I always believed that it was somehow my duty and responsibility as a Christian to avoid all problems in life, make my life perfect so that I could be a witness to the whole world of how great and awesome God is. But I would always wind up frustrated and and, and struggling because I could never reach this ideal. And I think we all do this to different degrees. We're called to live responsibly, but we can take that to an unhealthy extreme of striving and struggling to be problem-free. Whether we're perfectionists, workaholics, the life of the party, or control freaks, the root desire is to somehow get to a place where life is good and we don't have any more problems anymore. But even if we're living in these extremes, we know deep down inside that problems never end. Because the crazy thing that I think we all know about this life is that in in a fallen, broken world where sin and the consequences of sin are the natural order, even when good things happen, they can create problems. Like, for example, when you're given two great opportunities, things you've been waiting for and wanting, and then you have to decide between those two great opportunities. That's stressful. That's a problem. Or look at the inventions that we have to make life better and take care of problems. We have chemicals and things, medicines. They're, They're great. They solve some problems, but then they wind up causing other problems. Even when we have good things happen, problems seem to show up. And then I was once even thinking about the story of Lazarus, the man in the Bible who Jesus raised from the dead to life. 
And that's great. That's awesome. That's a good thing when we think about that. But then I got to thinking what he was actually raised to. And it was real life. Like leaky roofs that need repaired, and stomach bugs, and misunderstandings, and taxes, because they had taxes back then too. So, you know, our lives are going to be one problem after another until the day we die. So I found it really interesting when Emmanuel asked me to fill in for him this morning, and I asked him if I could look through the scriptures that we'd be reading over this past week. And, and, and as I read, I kept hearing the same words. Your life is going to be one problem after another. So I was like, okay, I guess, I guess this is where we're going. And I'd love to go through all of these passages and point out the unique ways that each of them give this message. But obviously there's not enough time for that. So we're going to focus on Luke 20, verses 9 through 19, because this passage most directly states this. Now, to set this up before we start reading, these passages are some of what we call Jesus' button-pushing words. Because <laughs> at this point in his ministry, he knows it's time for him to get to the cross. That day is coming, and it needs to come soon. But see, he can't go up to the Romans and say, hi, guys, I know you're not going to understand this, but I need to be crucified. And so I was wondering, can we schedule this? Like, do you have time sometime next week? He can't do that. That's not going to get him to the cross. So instead, he has to push buttons. He has to get people angry and riled up enough that they will request his crucifixion. And he said things that the people didn't like. Like, the biggest thing was that he contradicted their ways about how they felt problems needed to be solved, their ways of making the world better. But we need to keep in mind that in this button-pushing process, Jesus is not being hateful or spiteful. He's not seeking revenge here. He loves even the Jewish leaders who are going to be the most responsible for getting him to the cross. He wants them to come to him. And we know this because back in Luke 13, which we read a few weeks ago, I think, um, we see a conversation between Jesus and some of the Jewish leaders, and they're telling him, hey, Jesus... Herod wants to kill you. And and Jesus' answer is really interesting. But in a nutshell, what what he tells him is, yes, I'm going to die, and my death is going to fulfill my purpose. The leaders didn't understand really what he was talking about, but but that was his response. And then in in, uh, chapter 19, when Jesus is coming into the city of Jerusalem, this is the time when he's, he's preparing to be crucified. He knows this is coming. When he's walking into the city, he, he, he says these words. He, first of all, he weeps. And then he says, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. Jesus loved these people, and he, even the people he was about to get around. Now, I missed a part back, sorry, I missed a part back in the story about when he was talking with these Jewish leaders about Herod wanting to kill him. Right after Jesus um, talks with these people. He says with very deep emotion, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I want to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. Jesus loved these people very deeply. We have to remember that when we read these button-pushing passages. So let's go ahead and read this passage together. It says, Now Jesus turned to the people again and told them this story. A man planted a vineyard, leased it to tenant farmers, and moved to another country to live for several years. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent one of his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers attacked the servant, beat him up, and sent him back empty-handed. So the owner sent another servant, but they also insulted him, beat him up, and sent him away empty-handed. A third man was sent. And they wounded him and chased him away. What will I do? The owner asked himself. I know. I'll send my cherished son. Surely they'll respect him. But when the tenant farmers saw his son, they said to each other, Here comes the heir to this estate. Let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they dragged him out of the vineyard and murdered him. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do to them? Jesus asked. I'll tell you. 
he will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. How terrible that such a thing should ever happen, his listeners protested. Jesus looked at them and said, then what does this scripture mean? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Everyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone it falls on. The teachers of religious law and the leading priests wanted to arrest Jesus immediately because they realized he was telling the story against them. They were the wicked farmers, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. So what just happened here? We have Jesus telling some Jewish leaders and other people who were gathered this parable, describing how the Messiah would eventually be mistreated and brutally killed because of their hardened hearts. He definitely met his goal of angering the people. He, he adequately met that goal. And they were either so angry they couldn't even consider him being the Messiah, or they were really convinced he wasn't at this point anyway. So this pushed all of the right buttons for them. And we also have to remember that Jesus was speaking clear truth. He knew that all that he had said was actually in these people's hearts at this time, and he nailed it. But he also knew some deeper heart issues going on with his audience. He knew this concept was hard for both the Jewish leaders who didn't believe he was the Messiah and for his followers who did believe he was the Messiah because these two groups, although they were very different, they had something in common. He knew that both groups expected the promised Messiah to come and overthrow all the mean people and wipe out all their problems so everybody could live happily ever after. That was everybody's idea of what the Messiah should be. And he knew his way of being a Messiah through crucifixion and helping people with their problems was not their way. He knew that what he was going to do in his way and timing was going to be the best answer to the big picture of their problems that they were facing. But the Jewish leaders really didn't want to hear that. A Messiah to them was going to admire their, and validate and uphold their broken and, and twisted and oppressive and prideful religious system. And they just wanted a Messiah to come and wipe out everybody who didn't agree with them. And for Jesus' followers who were buying into the idea that he was the Messiah, this death thing, that wasn't Messiah stuff to them. A Messiah wasn't supposed to be a victim of all the mean people. He was supposed to get rid of them. This didn't fit what they were expecting. As I read this a couple times, this sad realization hit me, too, that that no one was really thinking about the lost souls of their oppressors and all the mean people and that God loved them and he wanted a relationship with them too. But Jesus was. He was thinking that. And the beautiful thing here is that in his spirit of grace, he understood compassionately that these people he was talking to just couldn't fully understand that picture. Yet. So after this parable that, yes, was angering and it did anger the people, in his final words about the cornerstone, you can once again hear his heart of compassion. He, in the end of all of this, wanted all of them to come to him in a relationship with him. And he's saying, I am that cornerstone. And the reason that you will reject me is because I'm not going to do things your way. And I'm not going to stop all the problems on earth. I have a different way than you expect to deal with all these things. And this was frustrating. But I also hear in these words of compassion, him saying, please, I wish you could let go of your expectations. And I wish you could see all that I'm doing because if you don't understand this, you, you're going to get crushed. You're going to get hurt. And you need me. Don't get crushed. Don't stumble over who I really am. And you can hear that echo again. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I don't want you to get crushed. He loved these people. But here it is in this passage. Your life is going to be one problem after another, and I'm not changing that. But trust me that I am solving these problems, even though I have a different way of resolving them. And Jesus knew exactly what that plan was going to look like. And interestingly, it's likely that all the people that he was talking to knew something more clearly that, that we might not, in his words, that we might not pick up on today. You see, they knew what a cornerstone was. A cornerstone is a special stone that had to be cut at just a perfect angle. 
And it had to be because it was going to serve as the foundation piece of a building. And they knew that a structure's stability was dependent on the integrity of the cornerstone because all the other stones in that building were going to be aligned according to that in reference to this one cornerstone. If it was off, even just a bit, it could throw off the entire structure's formation and then make it crooked and um, unstable and unsafe. So a cornerstone was real important. And to give you a better picture, a couple definitions that we use for cornerstone today are an important quality or feature on which a particular thing depends or is based. And another definition is the cornerstone of something is the basic part of it on which its existence, success, or truth depends. So what is Jesus asking humanity to do here? It's obvious he doesn't want us to stumble over him and his ways of helping us, even as different as they are from our ideals, because he doesn't want us to get crushed, but, but we need to understand how to live that out. As I was working on this, a theme kept coming to mind, and that was finding your sweet spot, the secret to not getting crushed. Your life is going to be one problem after another, so how do you deal with that? Any baseball fans this morning? Yeah? Any baseball players? Yeah, right there. Well, I don't speak fluent baseball, okay? And I didn't want to look really silly. So I went ahead and I looked up the definition of sweet spot. And this is what I found. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it is the area around the center of mass of a bat, racket, or head of a club that is the most effective part with which to hit a ball. Google said, an optimum point or combination of factors or qualities. The point or area on a bat, club, or racket at which it makes the most effective contact with the ball. And some other definitions were the part of a surface that gives the most powerful or power for the least effort. For example, when hitting a ball. Or the particular situation, quality, combination of things, etc., that is the best or most effective possible. So because I learned by putting things in my own words, I kind of reworded a different definition for myself. And I came with, with a sweet spot is the thing that launches you the very farthest you can possibly go in any given situation. That's my definition. Is that okay, baseball fans and players? Okay, all right. Good, then we don't have to go home. <laughs> all right. Now, we have a statement in the church that we commonly use when we're talking about dealing with problems. And um, it has kind of a sweet spot vibe to it or sound to it when we say it. And that statement is, Jesus is the answer. The unstated implication there is for every problem, right? Jesus is the answer for every problem. And I, I believe this, but I have a really irritating and intense analytical brain. So I can't take a statement with that like that, and I can't just leave it alone. But I have to, like, I have to take the lid off the box, and I have to pull out every part in the box and look at all the details on those parts and then figure out how all those parts fit together to create this picture of Jesus is the answer for every problem. Because what was happening for me is I would hear this statement at church, but then I'd go home, and problems would come up, and I'd say the statement that I knew to say, Jesus is the answer for this problem, but then I'd be frantically Googling or calling people and asking people, how did you deal with this? And I'd be brainstorming ways to try and solve my problems. Oh, but through gritted teeth, I was saying, Jesus is the answer, Jesus is the answer. But there was this disconnect between what I was saying, I believed, and how I was actually trying to solve problems. And that became a very big problem for me. I was basically tripping over the cornerstone. Throughout the Bible, we see examples of people, unlike me, who, who didn't stumble over the cornerstone. They're willing to, they were, through the things that they went through, they were willing to lay down their own perspectives and see and do things from God's bigger picture and perspective. Now, I only have a small number of them. I, we can't go through all of them today. And I'd love to tell these people's full stories because I feel telling the story draws our hearts into what they're experiencing. But we're not, I'm just going to give you the factual, quick version of each of these people. But we're going to look and see what, what, 
what was it that they found was their sweet spot? So I want to start with Joseph. Joseph was the favorite son of his father. And he had dreams that one day he was going to be this great ruler. And he made the mistake of telling his brothers, and his brothers got really jealous. So they took Joseph and they put him in a deep well, and then he got picked up by some slave traders and he was sold into slavery in Egypt. And while he was in Egypt, he worked his way up to being able to work for Potiphar. And while he was there working for Potiphar, this guy's wife then, he, she, she basically got him put in prison for some wrongs that she had done. All of this stuff that had happened to him was unfair. So Joseph had to work through some major forgiveness issues. All these people who kept making bad choices and getting him into bad places could have crushed him. But he depended on God to take care of the circumstances of his life and deal with the hearts of those who had tried to wound him. This process of learning to forgive and depending on God to take care of him and his, his circumstances enabled him to be able to rule with integrity. He was able to continue in his position of leadership and he learned to depend heavily on God. That's what made him a great ruler. Then we have Moses. Moses was raised in Egypt by Pharaoh's daughter. He was trained to be a leader and had everything going for him until he learned that he was actually a Hebrew and his birth family were all slaves. He wound up in the wilderness married to a shepherdess and according to the Egyptians, shepherding was the lowest the low that you could go. They had absolutely no respect for shepherds. But God eventually called Moses to lead the Hebrews out of Israel. And in this process, knowing all of his leadership training that he had in Egypt, God was asking him to do some things that, that would look ridiculous, would look silly and foolish to the Egyptian rulers. He was asking him to take a stick and, you know, use that to do great things, like put it over the water so the waters will part and bang it on a rock. The, Moses didn't learn these things in leadership training back in Egypt. And he knew that if he went before these Egyptian leaders, he was going to look pretty foolish. But Moses had to depend on God and God's ways of doing things in order to get to the victory that he eventually did get to. And then we look at David's life. David was anointed king, and he had to wait years under the current king who was crazy and trying to kill him. There's some similarities between what he and Joseph dealt with in this whole process of waiting to become a ruler and having to forgive people who were in his way, causing problems for him. But then later, when David did become king, he committed adultery, and he had um, her husband's wife killed, or the woman's husband killed. He could have fallen into despair and shame and continued to spiral downward in his sin, but he didn't. He had to depend on God to restore him back to integrity and to overcome all the inevitable temptations that would keep coming his way because of this sin. And because he was able to depend on God to, to, to forgive him and to help him overcome those things, he was also able to continue as the great ruler that we now know him as today. And then there's Esther. Esther was a young girl who was ripped away from the security and love of her home, and she was forced into a harem, which is basically prostitution. This was not a good environment. Her beauty treatments were not a day at the spa. Those treatments were not fun things to go through. And then going against everything she would have been taught as a young Jewish girl, she had to go before the king for a night. In a nutshell, she was objectified as a woman, and then she discovered she was being racially discriminated. Her husband's good friend who wanted to commit genocide was a threat to her people. And it, this was a situation that she realized that she alone was in a position to change. She could have cowered and bowed to the feelings of worthlessness and emptiness and kept her mouth shut, but she didn't. She fasted and prayed for guidance. And she had to depend on God to build up a sense of dignity and strength to be able to go before her husband 
uninvited, and eventually reveal her race, which could cost her her life. And then we have the disciples in the New Testament. These people were called out of lives where they had ideals, dreams, and responsibilities. But Jesus taught them to depend on God, and when he sent them out into ministry, this is the, this is the advice he gave them. He said, do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts, no bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. Now these people, they could have snuck some belongings in their bag when they went off into their ministry, but they didn't. Instead, they depended on God to meet all their needs instead of the things that they usually depended on. And this freed them up to be able to do amazing works of ministry. And then last, there's Paul. This intelligent, well-educated man who could speak different languages found himself saying, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he didn't. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. <coughs> Paul could have given up and, and, and been defeated, but he didn't. He depended on God to be strong in his weakness and take care of anything this weakness might hold him back from or problems that it might cause. And again, there are so many more people in the Bible that we could talk about, but, but for all of these people, their sweet spot was not their strengths and abilities, their talents, their appearances, wealth, comfort, or ideal circumstances. All of those things were a part of the process of, of getting to the places that they eventually got to, but, but they were not their sweet spot that got them out of messes and problems. These were just tools, and they had to depend on God to show them how and when to use them, if at all. And it's the same for all of us. All of our God-given strengths and abilities are tools that God can use, but we can't trust in them or depend on them to help us get through problems in life. And at times, like for Moses, with his royal training, these strengths and abilities may be irrelevant and mean nothing at all in the plans that God has for us. But we see in these stories that each of them found themselves having to bow before God, acknowledge that they could not achieve any kind of victory on their own, but had to depend on God with no reservation or plan B. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about with this whole cornerstone thing. He's saying, just trust me and my ways of helping. Taking our hands off of our problems, getting out of the way, crying out to God, asking him to reveal the truth about our problems, asking for his instructions on how to deal with them, and then trusting him enough to do what he instructs us to do in any problem we face is all, always our sweet spot. Because this is how we were originally created to live and function, as we see way back in the Garden of Eden, where they were completely dependent on God for everything they needed. I've learned that there are two very different ways of approaching Christianity. It's one thing to say I'm dependent on myself to follow God's ways and be a Christian. And it's an entirely different thing to say I am dependent on God. The differences sound subtle, but they're actually quite profound in how they play out in our lives. A common statement that we hear in Christian circles is that God helps those who help themselves. This sounds biblical, but it's not actually in the Bible. Now, there are two verses that people use to, to support this statement, and I've studied them, and if you, if you push them hard enough and you take them a bit out of context, you could, you could conclude that, that God helps those who help themselves. But the statement was made famous by a well-known deist who believed that God was just up in the sky somewhere watching all of us live our lives. But he didn't believe in having a relationship with God. He didn't believe God wanted to interact with us. This man's name was Benjamin Franklin. But in contrast to that idea, the, the scriptures over and over teach a completely opposite approach. That God only helps those who cannot help themselves. 
people who can't stop sinning on their own, people who can't solve their problems, people who don't have all the solutions, and, and, and when they try to numb their pain, they don't feel better. People who find themselves in impossible circumstances and can't work their own way out of it, and they, they acknowledge it. They know it, and they need it. They admit it. Second Chronicles 16.9 tells us that God is searching the earth for those whose hearts are fully committed to him, to give them strong support, and he loves to do this for people who know they need it and they want it. I remember one day when I decided I wanted to teach one of my girls um, how to paint with watercolors. I think, I think she was about two. And I was so excited as a mom to, to, to let her you know, put paint on, on paper and see these beautiful pictures. And I was just really excited about this. This is something only a mom can be excited about. <laughs> So I set out the paint tray, a cup of water, paper, and a paintbrush, and I set her down in the chair at the table. And then I realized I forgot a paint smock. Now, I know that watercolor does not stain. I get that. But I don't like laundry, and I don't like changing clothes all day, and I, I just, I, I didn't want to do more laundry, so I decided I had to have this paint smock. So I told her, that I needed to go upstairs and get a paint smock, so she needed to no touch the paint, and no touch the water, and no touch the paintbrush, because when I came back down, I was gonna show her how to paint. And so she was all excited, we had this happy yay agreement, it was so exciting. And I went upstairs and I grabbed the paint smock. Less than 45 seconds later, I came downstairs, only to find the cup of water tip conveniently over into the paint tray, and, and, and there, was, there were these streams of grayish, muddy-looking water flowing between the colors, mixing them all together. And here is my precious toddler sitting there with a big smile on her face and the paintbrush in her hand. And I, I recognized this was my fault. I mean, I don't know who in their right mind leaves a toddler next to paint and expects them not to paint. So I get this was on me. But, but regardless, I had to make the sad announcement that we were not going to get to paint today. And it was very, very sad. I had to clean up the mess, and we'd have to buy new paint before we could paint again. Whatever the motives were, whatever was going on there, she wasn't able to follow my instructions. And I realized that as an adult, this is what I do with God all the time. Instead of believing that when God says he's going to show me the way to get through, and give me instructions so I can get the best results possible. I push ahead of him when it feels like he's taking too long or he's not doing things my way. There are good and wonderful things that he wants to do to help me each and every day to get through life, but I decide I'm going to do it all by myself. And I make big messes, and sometimes I create very painful this is stumbling over the cornerstone because he isn't doing the things in the ways that I think he should, and I'm getting crushed in the process. If only we knew the brilliant, beautiful pictures that he wants to see painted in our lives and the joy of the victories that he wants to give us in every situation and problem that we face. I have some quotes on the, one of the bulletin boards here that, that speaks to this, and, and my favorite one of them is, God is not a deceiver, that he should offer to support us, and then when we lean upon him, should slip away from us. We can count on that. He wants to do good things in our lives. But when we depend on ourselves to figure everything out and fix our own problems in our own ways, we can get really tired and overwhelmed and stressed. And this can be a recipe for a whole lot of anger and frustration. We live in a very angry world. I heard a quote last week asking, is this the end of civility? They're referring to the sense we're getting now that when someone's trying to solve a problem, they have to go after anyone who doesn't see the solution the same way that they do. And it's kind of scary out there, no matter what uh, your political views are, it's scary for all of us. The problems that we're dealing with are very real and legitimate. 
And it seems that everyone's concerned about the exact same things, but everyone has different opinions about how to solve them, and that's where the problems begin. But I got to thinking one day what it might be like if everyone in the whole entire world on the same day, at exactly the same time, dropped everything they were doing and put their hands up to the sky, and they said, God, I don't know what to do. There's so many problems. I don't know how to solve them, but I'm going to stop messing things up. I'm going to stop trying to fix them, because I believe that you have the best ways to solve these. I know your heart is good, and so I want to turn to you. Show us how to solve these problems, and we'll follow your instructions. And when I was thinking about it, I thought, wow, what an awesome world that would be. And then I realized that was a pretty lofty dream. That's not going to happen here on earth. But that is a picture of heaven. It, this is, heaven is where every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what is a Lord? <clears throat> he is someone who is in total authority. Everyone turns to him for instructions and for provision, and, and, and he's in total control. We love the verse in the Bible about heaven where it says that the lion will lay with the lamb. Why do we love that picture so much? Because it's the ultimate symbol of perfect, absolute peace. And of course, my analytical brain can't just leave that pretty picture alone. I have to go deeper and try and figure out why it works that way, what's going on here. So I'm not sure, but this is, this is what I came up with. It seems to me that based on what we know of lions, they don't attack when their stomachs are full and when they don't feel threatened. And if in heaven all of their needs are adequately met by God all the time, they never have any reason to attack. Or fight. And if a lamb who has a reputation of being the most helpless and meek creature has all of his needs met for security, safety, and he's always perfectly provided for, he can take a risk and go and lay down next to a big, ferocious looking lion. Because they're both completely dependent on God in heaven and all of their needs are being met, there's no need for them to attack or fight or live in fear. According to the Bible in heaven, it will even be dependent on God for just light. That's not going to come from the moon and the stars and the sun. It's going to come directly from him. That's what heaven's going to be. Everyone is going to be dependent on God for absolutely everything. And as a result, there will be no fighting. There will be perfect peace, no suffering. Total, complete dependence on God is always the sweet spot. So I want to go back to our baseball illustration. In the game of life, when a ball is pitched, we'll say that that ball is a problem of any sort, big or little. It's intended to throw us off, confuse us, cause a loss, or even create defeat. But when that problem hits the sweet spot on our bat of complete and total dependence on God, We'll see it flying out of the ballpark, and we will get to experience a great victory. So what part of our bats are our problems hitting? You know what problems you're dealing with this morning. Are they hitting the sweet spot of total dependence or some other parts of the bat, like self-reliance or intelligence and education, talents, gifts, and abilities, denial? good looks and appearances, good reputations, seeking revenge, financial well-being, planning and controlling. What part of our lives are our problems hitting? Because if our problems are hitting any of those things, we might get a few decent hits once in a while, but we're going to start getting overwhelmed and exhausted from all the extra work and effort it takes to see just a minimal amount of points add up on, on the scoreboard. We won't be able to get those sweet victories that we really need to get ahead of. But we can always try the sweet spot at any time. When we're depending on God, we must remember that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is what we are depending on. That power that was displayed as the answer that the Jewish leaders and followers of Jesus didn't want because Jesus wasn't doing things their way and they were stumbling over. 
That's the power that we depend on. And here's the most relational and beautiful thing to me personally. I have things, problems in my life that I wish would have stopped. I wish they would have never happened. Problems that I know for sure were not God's will for my life. And I say that because James 1.13 says that no one should say God is tempting them. He cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God is not the author of sin and chaos. But he does identify with the pain that I feel when problems of any kind that come my way don't stop. And Jesus doesn't give me victory by saying, just quit your crying, deal with it. I'm going to give you victory, just you're fine, you're okay. I know he doesn't do that. I know he lets me weep and cry because in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cried intensely. He sweat drops of blood. And even though he knew the resurrection was coming, he felt fully the pain of this moment. He asked the Father to take the cup of suffering from him, but that couldn't happen. Jesus could have stopped his own suffering and crucifixion, just like he could stop all of my problems. But because sin is the order and law of this world, he had to go all the way through with it. And he identifies with me when I have to go all the way through very difficult things. Because of this, I feel safe to just crawl into his lap and cry sometimes, Jesus, it hurts. It hurts. And I can feel him weeping with me and saying, I know it hurts. It hurts me too. But just cling to me. And I promise you, when we get through this together, there's going to be a great victory. Just trust me. He identifies with our pain. And when we choose to find our sweet spot and depend totally on him, he will pour out whatever insight, provision, and assistance we need to give us sweet victories even when everything around us is fallen and broken. And then we can wholeheartedly say, Jesus and his ways are the answer for every problem. We're going to go ahead and watch a video now, a song that, that sums us up. So I want you to just speak to God and, and see what he might be wanting to say to you while we watch this video together.